Hello, friends. My name is Coleman Domingo. And for those who need to uh, know what I look like visually, what's happening here is I'm a 51-year-old African-American man. I'm wearing a black turtleneck. I have a short cropped haircut and I have a backdrop that is very much um, teak wood. So I'm like, I look like I'm in a little box of wood, which is a mid-century modern house. That's me. And um, I'd like to introduce our panelists today and they will introduce themselves as well. We have the writer, director, and producer, Mr. Doug Rowland. Great. And we also have executive producer, Marley Matlin. We have the two leads, the two stars of this short film. We have Robert Tarango. He's one of the first deafblind actors to star in a film, which is, uh, I think, tremendous. And we also have Stephen Prescott. All right, wonderful. I had the pleasure of um, witnessing this short film just a couple of days ago. And I watched it again this morning to make sure what I saw was true. And what was true about it was that it had, it was so simple and it got to the heart of two people that just has this wonderful interaction and it changes, I think both of their lives. It says that it changes one of their lives, but I think it changes both of them in some way. I think it's about goodness and caring and reaching out to others in the world, especially right now when those messages are even more profound. We want that moment. I think maybe there's something in it and I'll just hold off on my thoughts because I want to get into um, this great panel, but there was something that stood out to me and it was the moment when um, Steven's character put his, uh, started writing on Robert's hand. And I, I don't know why it affected me so much, but I'm actually processing it now. It's the idea of touch, that we have not been allowed to touch each other for the past year. And then you look at how important it is to touch and connect with someone. The idea, it's very intimate to put your finger in someone else's palm and have that trust. And that was the most profound moment in this short film to me. And there are many profound moments. And so I would like to start with you, Doug, if you wouldn't mind um, giving an intro to yourself visually and also telling me the genesis of this short film. Well, thank you, Coleman, so much for, for leading the show today and uh, for those kind words. Really appreciate it. Um, I'm Doug Rowland. I'm a white male in my mid-30s. I've got a dark beard like and uh, short, short dark hair and a, and a white plain backdrop. And I'm also wearing a dark button-up shirt. And, you know, Coleman, before I answer that... Um, I love how the you know how the the touch element stood out for you so much. I mean, you know, I, this film was made before the pandemic, but you know, we, we couldn't have imagined how much more relevant the theme of touch is um, to, in the time that we've been showing it, which is primarily during a pandemic where touch is prohibited. And I think it's as you said, it's something that we've all missed. Um, that just the, the intimacy of being able to just freely touch someone else and, and that's something that certainly has kind of been um, a silver lining of obviously a very challenging time but to, 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 to be able to express that kind of connection um, is something that we've um, has been even even better than we could have imagined you know given the context that we've been showing it in but just real quick you know the origin story of this it was um, it was uh, inspired by a real in, uh, encounter that I had um, going back 10 years ago um, when I was still living in New York City where I'm from. Um, I, similar to what you see in the film, I was coming home late one night and I saw a man standing on a street corner holding a sign that said I'm deaf and blind and need help crossing the street. And again, just like the film, um, you know, I took him to a bus stop. He wrote, he took out a notepad and wrote a bus stop that he needed, which I took him there. And um, uh, a bus wasn't coming for a very long time, so I sat, I wanted to let him know I'd sit and wait with him. I didn't know how to communicate with him, but fortunately, just instinctively, again, similar as to you've seen the film, I took his palm, started tracing one letter at a time on it to let him know I'd sit and wait with him, and he understood what I was writing to him, and we were able to have a whole conversation that way, me writing one letter at a time on his palm, him writing back in a notepad, you know, what at first started very basic, me introducing myself, him letting me know his, his name was, he referred to himself as Arts, A-R-T-Z. I would later find out his name was Artemio, his full name. Um, but then we got into a much more personal conversation and it was, I mean, it was one of those occurrences where I just knew as it was happening that it was such a, 
so impactful and such a, you know, a kind of every molecule in me was firing. Um, but I think it's been this many year process to bring it to the screen and share it with people where I've really kind of learned what was being gained in that moment. But simply put, it was, um, what was, was being inspired. gained for you in that moment? What was being gained for you? Then? You know, and, and you know, it's interesting because how I would first describe it is that I was just had the great fortune to connect with someone from a community I'd never met before in the deafblind community and got to know him in this one encounter is just this beautiful, charismatic, funny guy, which I think is the most resonant thing. I think anytime I know for me coming from the, um, the environment I came from where I didn't have anyone in my personal life um, that who was uh, from the disability community, let alone the deaf blind community that I, um, I did first, the, the, the first time I laid eyes on, on this man, Artemio, the most notable thing was that he was deaf blind and that by the end of the interaction, I really just saw him as like my new friend, Artemio. Mm -hmm. I was, you know, tearing up as his bus pulled away. Cause I'm like, Oh, like there goes my new friend. I'm never going to see again. So I think mm -hmm. that's kind of like the most resonant thing. But you know, for me, it comes back to this more universal takeaway of just it, it, whether it's whatever the difference is that someone might be across from you, that there's this more resonant, um, connective place. Um, and just finding that, the, just finding that connection point, regardless of whatever our differences might be, is the thing that comes up for me over and over again. And I think has application to, to anything, to any, any circumstance with two people. That's what I found to be so beautiful. I really thought this is exactly, it's part of the conversation I think that we're all having as a culture and our, and our communities about how do we reach across and learn something new about someone else. So that's why I think that's, it's, it's really affected. I think it's beautiful. So I'm, I'm glad you're sharing it with us. Um, and I wanna to talk to uh, Marley about the casting because we have, um, there's truly authentic casting in process here. It is a, 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 a blind deaf uh, actor being played by a blind and deaf actor. And that's, I think it's, it's unique, but also, could you talk to me about that? Could you tell us about that and why it was so important? Thank you. I'm Marley and I'm a white woman with blonde hair and I'm wearing a gray blazer and a black shirt with a little I love you pendant. And my background is a bookcase with different plates for my kitchen, uh, items I've collected. And maybe there's an Academy Award behind me as well. Okay, what can I say? <laughs> anyway, I am four years older than you, Coleman. So anyway, I want to let you know. You did the math, you figured it out. I won't say it, but you know how old I am now. <laughs> Uh, anyway, um, uh, you know, when I first saw the film, uh, the film had been produced already. It, it, it was the best 18 minutes I'd ever spent in front of a screen. Um, it was because it was authentic. The whole package uh, was, uh, you know, not only an authentic casting, as you mentioned, um, and uh, I mean, putting the two, the African-American homeless guy, the deaf blind guy, bringing the story together uh, just spoke of authenticity because uh, we looked at not only what they were saying, but we could see the humanness of them. And, you know, the fact that they're meeting in them, you know, what happened to Doug and the fact that it's expressed on the screen. Um, and when we say authentic, I say it with a capital A um, because in terms of casting, uh, there was, it was, so thrilling for me to see that a deaf, I mean, I'd never seen Robert before this film. I didn't know of him. Uh, and when I found out that he was deaf blind, I was like, how better to tell this story than to have this cast authentically. And we've come a long way from when I was in this industry, having been in it for 35 years, We've come a long way to try to convince this industry, powerful people who make films happen, producers, writers, directors, studios, that they need to understand the importance of authenticity when it comes to acting, particularly when it comes to deaf and now with deaf blind individuals. Diversity is very important as well. I've been using this word diversity for the longest time and 
I know, Coleman, you're aware of what we're talking about when we talk about diversity. Stephen understands. Everyone understands that it. I'm just thrilled to be a, a part of a film that includes all of these elements, and it, it needs to be seen by everyone. Uh, people will have a much better understanding as a result of seeing the film that authenticity tells real stories <clears throat> as opposed to someone putting on, I, I, I like to say that it's in the past that disability is not a costume. You don't put it on like a costume and you take it off. It has to be authentic. Well said, thank you. And I would love to talk about the casting process. Um, Robert, you are the first deafblind actor in a film. Uh, I'm sure you understand the significance of that. Will you tell us about how you got cast? Tell us about where were you? What was when you when you this project came to you? Tell us about that. This is Robert speaking. I am wearing a green T-shirt. I am a 55 year old man with salt and pepper hair, and I am tan skinned. So how I first met Doug, um, I was at work. I was a kitchen worker where I had been working for over 21 years. And my boss, Dan, came over to me and said, hey, can you come here a second? And I was like, sure, what's up? He said, you need to go over to the other building. But they didn't tell me why. And I'm like, okay. So I was like, well, what's going on? He didn't have any information. So I took a walk over to the other building, which we refer to as the training building. And I had to give my eyes a couple of minutes to adjust coming out from the light into uh, a darkened room. And when I sat down, I started looking around and Doug started talking to me and taught, started explaining the project and what this could be and if I would be interested in being in a movie. And as he kept talking, I just started getting more and more and more excited. It lit a fire in me. Um, and, you know, as I know that he had interviewed seven candidates up until that point, and again, I was just at work. And so when my boss came to me and said, hey, why don't you go over to the training building and do this? I was like, what? So I really had no preconceived knowledge of what was going on. Ultimately, I got the call that I was selected. And after which I found out I was the first deaf blind person in a film. That feeling mm. was, indescribable, amazing. I just thought, I'm like, I did it. And, you know, Doug cast me in feeling through and here we are. That's beautiful. What do you want to do next? Well, I think that one of the things that I, you know, would like to do um, is when I was in New York, um, when we went for the first time to actually film the film was kind of unique. And I sat down, they started doing my makeup and I was like, what are they doing? I'm like, oh, yeah, this movie. <laughs> I was like, oh, okay, so this is what this looks like, huh? Um, but again, that feeling, that inspiration, that <sighs> success, I, I don't even know how to describe it. it. It's really, again, indescribable that I feel like I was a part of this and it was my own. Beautiful. Beautiful, thank you, Tariq, the other, the other lead of this film. Um, I'm Stephen, who plays Tariq. So you're you're so convincing. I, I just thought of you as Tariq because I was like you were just so authentic, um, and I cared for this guy I, very quickly. I cared for you, um, and I knew that your sense of pride. You couldn't. You're trying to find your way. You're trying to find a place to sleep for that night, and then the universe takes on. Uh, its own purpose with you to lead you somewhere else. I thought you were very affecting, a very uh, very beautiful actor. Is there, where did you draw your inspiration from uh, to create a character like Tariq? A great question, Coleman, thank you. And um, I am a black, Af I'm an African-American male in my late twenties. I have box braids pulled back into a ponytail and I have a great background. Uh, where I pulled my inspiration from actually was from a young man. His name is Norkson. He, he was walking down the street as I was walking my, my pup, Ginger, who's 10 years old now. 
uh, I was walking her on the sidewalk and then this young man, he was across the street watching me and then he just came walking towards me. And like, I was a bit quick to be on like the fence, but like, I was like, okay, he's like, okay, it has to be a reason why he's just walking towards me. So he walks up to me and then he's like, hey, man, have, do you have like $2 you could spare uh, for some coffee? And he was like younger than I was. I was like, he would do like, how, like, how old are you? Like, he said he was 18. And uh, I said, like, where are your parents? I asked him, like, where are your parents? And things like that. And he said, uh, it, he don't have any parents. Like, his mother passed away. And he hasn't been in communication with his, with his dad. So he didn't have any place to stay that night. And I said, you know what? Like, yo, just, you could chill. You could, like, I'm going to find out with my aunt if you could spend the night by me. Mm. And I, like, went upstairs and I spoke to my, my aunt and my cousins. And I said, there's this young man outside. And I'm, I told him I'll, I'll let him stay here tonight. I think he's like my spirit gifts to him. I think he's a really cool, cool guy. And they were, and my family, I think they they trust my judgment. So like, okay. And he came in. I gave him, you know, some new clothes and things like that. So like that really resonated with me. That actually that this role found that we found each other. That this role that I found this role and this role found me because it made me think of him so much. And like even after that interaction with him, I will see him like you know, peppered throughout the years and months. So it was really him who I drew my energy and conscious from going into that character. Stephen, that's beautiful. I think there's there's always a great, I think, alchemy between actor and character. And I think that there's a lot of that character that lived in you, that empathy, and you can see it coming through your eyes, truly. Beautiful work. Thank you. It's a comment. Thank you. Sure. Um, Doug, I want to know um, your process. You know, to, because you, you've taken this film from a real life experience and then theatricalized it in some way, you know, created another character and things like that. And also, I wanted to know, where did you immerse yourself in the deafblind community as well? How did you make it so authentic, you know? Yeah, well, um, you know, to start with the writing process, you know, I think um, anytime you're you're drawing upon inspiration of something that's happened to you, it's, it's a, it can be a, a real gift and a curse, if you, depending yes. on how you use it. <laughs> You know, for me, I quickly found that there were certain details that had happened that needed to be in there and kind of help guide some of the plot points in the narrative. But that ultimately, mm -hmm. as I was working through it, the story that was demanding to be told was something that was very different than, you know, beat for beat what happened to me. And through various drafts, it took on a different form and, you know, you know, is definitely something that I still say is heavily inspired by the encounter I had with Artemio, but a fictional story that's not meant to express, you know, is not meant to represent that one-to-one -one in any way. Um, mm -hmm. And that was really just, you know, that organic process of just, you know, draft, you know, draft after draft and kind of figuring out what, because a, a lot of times like we were, you know, in the, in my first response talking about this, this whole process has been really me understanding what it was I was trying to say in the first place. The first step of that is the writing process of where you have that like lightning bolt of inspiration in this case a real life occurrence but you don't really know what you're trying to say until you get in there and and really play with it um but as far as the process you know on set um again i had the real privilege to partner with helen keller services and the helen keller national center same entity different uh, branches of it um to to make this film um and really you know really so fortunate for that because at the time that I started this process of making the film, I'd still only met Artemio many years prior and, and still did not know the deafblind community. So what transpired was, you know, a, a lengthy eight month plus process of really getting to know the local deafblind community here in Los Angeles, um, going into the Braille Institute, meeting everyone there, sitting in on the deafblind classes there, meeting people who are deafblind that uh, go there, going to a deafblind living facility out in Eagle Rock near where I live here in Los Angeles, getting to meet everyone there, and then flying back to New York regularly to go up to the Helen Keller National Center in Long Island and getting to, you know, not just meet and all the staff and, and the, um, p p uh, a lot of, so basically just to explain real quick what HKNC is, is, that people from who are deafblind from all around the country go there for up to a year to learn independent living skills. And so I got to meet a lot of the students there, all the staff, but also really had this time to really form meaningful relationships with the community. You know, um, 
Chris Woodfill, who's the associate executive director there, he's deaf blind himself. He um, he was the one who I worked with most closely for the, during the casting process. Um, so uh, you know, got to collaborate with him to to f- find Robert in the fateful way that he described, um, and make a number of meaningful relationships along the way. And now three years into this process and working with and for Helen Keller Services for the last couple of those years. Um, the community is a daily part of my life as far as, you know, collaborators, colleagues, friends. But I, again, having that good long period of time to really get to know the community in an intimate way. And then mm. having the great interpreting team, some of which is here today, to facilitate communication between uh, Robert and myself and have a really smooth process uh, on set. You know, figure out what, whatever we had time to figure out what we needed to on set. To, to, to facilitate the, the most uh, efficient and best communication. Um, and, you know, again, it's that collaboration that really made it happen. And as a someone leading the charge in that way, I think this is gonna eventually come fall over into a producerial question as well, because I think it can help our communities uh, see it as it's a great, it's a, it's a wonderful challenge that you can meet. And it sounds like you met the challenge. Were there some challenges that you did not foresee and you were able to figure that stuff out and sort of like hopefully give us a template yeah. and give people more tools to work with? Did you figure some things out? Yeah, you know, Coleman, that's a really great question. And the, 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 I'll answer that more specifically in a second, but overarching, and you well know this having been on many sets, um, filmmaking's always hard, right? There's always unforeseen things that happen. So I think first and foremost, you know, I'd urge people who maybe haven't had experiences um, wh- where they need to, to consider accessibility, where they maybe, you know, haven't had to consider accessibility components on previous sets and are maybe intimidated by that. It's something that you can very easily figure out like any other element of filmmaking. You right. know, it's, it's, <laughs> yes. just, it's yes. just part of, and there's, there's so many people, so many entities and individuals who you could easily just bring on to, to consult all the way through. So you, you wouldn't even have to figure it out on your own. Um, but you really just, I, I, it's a mindset thing more than anything. Um, in, in that, like, it's something that is just, there are so many things that just need to be accounted for when you're going to shoot a film. And that's just one of many. And it's not, it's nothing that's, um, too hard or too difficult to figure out, particularly if you have people who know what they're doing. And the thing that I would add on to that, and I think it's really, really important. And it's something that I like to embrace as a filmmaker in any film that I've been able to make, but it is those things that could easily be labeled as challenges or obstacles that are the right. very thing that make the final product what it is. So it's like I... we we wouldn't feeling through isn't what it is, and it hasn't it wouldn't have moved as many people as we've been fortunate to bring it to and move had it not been not just Robert on the screen, but the way in which we, we you know myself and everyone else on that crew who was working with a deafblind actor for the first time learned a lot more about humanity and themselves through the process and the way that creates an environment and an energy that comes through in everything you do. So for me, it's like, you know, we, people get so much and I get it, right? It's a business too. People get so much in the mindset of like the X's and O's and the bottom line and how much something costs and how, how much time something is and, and what, what, how much that costs. But also at the end of the day, we're making something with, for the purpose of moving people, of engaging people, of hope, hopefully opening people's minds to new things. And you do that by, it starts with what your team looks like and how you go about what you're doing. That, that, those things, it's a one-to-one connection to what ends up on the screen. So, yeah. but beyond that, we did just to, you know, cut this long-winded answer a little shorter, just with the last part to, to add on to that. One thing that we did learn a lot about was doing these fully accessible screening events. Fortunately, prior to the pandemic, I collaborated with Helen Keller National Center to create these accessible screening events that would have as many as 50 interpreters and support staff in an individual screening to provide one-to-one accessibility because we knew before showing it to anyone, we knew that it was important that the deafblind community who was at the heart of this film was able to experience it alongside everyone else. And that we maybe cracked a little bit more of the code there that felt like maybe treading new water in a certain way. But again, things that are, we've freely passed along what we've learned to anyone who's approached us and things that are not hard to figure out if you just 
have the right team and the willingness to, to do so. That's beautiful, beautiful. Uh, Marley, I'd like to ask you a question, please. Um, how can the film industry steer, steer clear of tokenism and uh, avoid using disability as a storytelling prop? That's a good question. Um, I mean, tokenism is obviously, I mean, people, a lot of people don't understand or realize that tokenism is rampant and has, in terms of the community, been used quite a bit. I can probably say that it's just a fact that they don't know. And it's up to us to educate them, uh, to those who aren't clued in, who aren't necessarily as knowledgeable as we are when it has to do with representation on screen, especially if you're talking about deaf and deafblind individuals or whatever, whatever uh, gender, race, whatever you're talking about. Right now, as we speak, we need to we need to combat all the isms in general in Hollywood, all the isms. And how we do that is we educate, is we have conversations, is that we, I mean, it's basically collaborate, collaborate. And that's why I'm so thrilled that Doug followed that process. He collaborated with the Helen Keller National Services, the Helen Keller Center. And what Doug said earlier about using authentic uh, characters, actors, using um, uh, whether we're talking about the process uh, uh, on the set of using interpreters and then thinking about it strictly from a numbers point of view and a schedule point of view and a crew point of view. And the fact it's not rocket science, it's doable. If you keep in mind the same way you do with everything else that you work on a set. And at the end of the day, it comes down to collaboration and working with people who know how, how it goes. It may be new, but at the end of the day, everyone needs to understand and needs to listen to one another because you're talking about making a movie here. And at the end of the day, the, the movie as we saw here is beautiful. It truly is, thank you. And you know what, I, I, when, I, when I have a new job, for example, and I'm offered a, a script and I take a look at it, if I feel there is something there. It's something that I want to do. Play this character, for example. I, first of all, have to feel good about the character. I have to be excited. It has to excite me. But I also, and they think, well, okay, it's fine. You have to go to the set. It's the same thing. Yes, it is. The environment pretty much is standard when it comes to sets. It's, it's fairly typical. There's the crew. There's, everyone has their job to do. But they don't, we don't know each other. So it's a learning experience, whether you're talking about with an actor who's disabled or not disabled, we all have to learn about each other. So why not just incorporate this into the process? It's, I always am the one who breaks the ice. I'm always the one to take Same here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And that's how we work. That's how we work. That's how we do it. So if you want a good, uh, smooth relationship, uh, because we're doing something that's different, but we're doing something together and we're creating together and we're creating a beautiful product. So you have to work as a team and it's just a matter of, you know, making sure it's two ways. And bottom line is we just have to remove, again, all the isms that take place in Hollywood. That's all we have to do. Thank you. That's wonderful. Uh, Robert and Steven, how was it working with each other? How did you, it's a very intimate, um, it's a two-hander. And so you had to, you can just tell that there's a lot of trust and faith in each other. And um, how, did you, how did you figure out how to work with each other, just generally? Let's start with that, Stephen. Well, with the help of the Helen Keller and Doug already prepping me before going into it, you know, because I did have my ideas on like, how would it be working with Robert? But like all the uh, preconotions that I had about working with a deafblind actor went out the window when I met Robert. Uh, he, this man is talented, you know, and we did have a chance to bond and I felt that Robert is very talented and we were able to communicate through our interpreters and I just felt like the the trust was important with anyone that I work with I feel that it's always important to just build a certain type of connection to to, an, to the extent that the other person wants to build with and Robert was very open to that so uh, it was very helpful to work with him on and off camera. Stephen there's um this is a, a testament to not only you, but also to Doug, that I think that there's something else going on in this film that I realize as we're speaking about it, that you don't see often, which is tenderness between men, which is care, 
it's it's actually like it's really smashing tropes over the head. What you may came in thinking about a deaf blind person, what you came in thinking about an African American male, suddenly you have to rethink that. <laughs> you know, that's what I think is so powerful because suddenly you're like, oh my gosh, look at how, the tenderness and care. And this is a young homeless kid who doesn't have anything. And look at all this. You you you're humanizing the, these men, which is so beautiful. And I just want to say that's a testament to uh, your heart, Doug, and your performance as well, Stephen. There was something that you, sorry, before Robert comes uh, answers, it was something that you said about human touch. And that was something that Robert actually mentioned before going into the film, that um, something that frustrates him is like the human connection. And like that, that was something that resonated with me when he spoke about it, because he was very passionate about how he felt with, you know, just humans helping each other and, and being there for one another. So that was something that really stood with me that Robert had. Beautiful, beautiful. Uh, Robert, how was it working with uh, Stephen? I think before I get to that, generally speaking, seeing this film for people who are not in the know, so hearing people who have never met a deafblind person or even a deaf person, when you think about communication and forming a relationship, I think seeing this film makes people go, oh, it's not that difficult, or oh, I can yeah. touch their hand, or oh, there's this place called Helen Keller National Center where people go to actually learn to prepare for their futures so they can regain their independence. And it doesn't have to be frightening. And people don't have to think that I can't. You know, it gives you the opportunity to look at alternatives when you're talking to people of different abilities or different ways of communicating. And I think that's what the whole point of this is now. It's just generalizing and going, wow, I, I can do this. And I can communicate with somebody that I never thought I could. And it doesn't have to be difficult or something that causes fear or angst. I think it's just the willingness. And that's what happened with Steven. It's that willingness to go up and to meet somebody and go, oh, I can. And we can do this print on palm thing, writing on one, somebody's hand. And I think that those that have had exposure to the Helen Keller National Center, you know, the, the consumers that go there learn how to make this um, fluid and it's basic training so that we can meet other people and make it easy and make it commonplace so that people are like, oh, and now the film, it actualizes it so that people aren't afraid of us and that people see how easy it could happen and it makes us connected. Beautiful. There's also a wonderful moment when um, Stephen's going through the pages when he's um, when Robert's asleep. And I think it's a beautiful touch, Doug, because it humanizes him even more. You see that he's he wants touch or a kiss, that he knows about, can you close the door, please, when you leave, or whatever, safety, security. That he's a full, fully human, fully realized human being, and not something you should be. I thought it was very, it was beautiful. It's all these beautiful touches. I'm just gonna keep you know fanning the flames of uh, supporting how beautiful this film is. Um, but it was beautiful. I, that, that, that's another moment that stood out to me. Um, the, this, this, this whole movie, this whole yeah. movie is a win-win. Yes. For everyone involved, for the actors and for the viewers. Mm -hmm. I agree. Uh, Doug, what has been the most rewarding part of this journey for you? I'm, I'm going to get to that in a second. It's kind of related, but I want to just touch on what you were just saying Coleman and also what Robert was noting and thank you for those kind words and that the moment that you just picked out and connecting to what Robert was saying about a lot of time like telling people to not be afraid you know just because you've never met someone who's deafblind it's not scary we're people just like anyone else just understand yeah. that even if you've never met us you know another thing that stands out to me so much about exhibiting this film during the time that we're doing doing it right now is not only the element, it's cr related to the element of touch during a pandemic, but also, you know, not looking, not looking at people who are different from us in, in being fearful of people who are different from us during a time where this, we've been so, it's been such a divisive time and there's been such a hard split between I'm on this side, you're on that side. And, and just this, you know, a lot of fear of what those other people are doing or what those other people mm -hmm. think. And for me, it's like, that's such a thing that really is hitting me hard in this conversation today and something that comes up a lot 
in showing it during the time we, we were showing it is just this understanding of what's more resonant than whatever differences we might have is the fact that we, we all want to kiss. We all yeah. want to hug. We all have these basic human needs that connect us so much deeper than whatever differences we might have. And as cliche as that may sound, it's something that's so needed to feel and experience and see now more than ever when there's um, so not only so much divisiveness, but such barriers, you know, between us to be able to foster those connections. And, you know, it's something that, you know, it really resonates with me when, when Robert, you know, says, Hey, look, don't be afraid of us. If you, you know, it's the, if, I'm just like you. And that's something that we hope people take away from this film. Um, and you know, to, to just answer your question, Coleman, as far as the most rewarding part of this, um, it's really been able to, it's, it's been the universal takeaways for this. There's people from the deafblind community who've seen this and are, um, moved by it and, and, and are so happy to know of this representation for their community in a film. And also on the other end of the spectrum, people who have never, not only ever met anyone who is deafblind, but maybe never even thought about the community who come away uh, feeling, having gained some sort of curiosity and understanding and connection to a community that they previously maybe had never even thought about. But one really quick anecdote that I think drives it home more than anything else is that at our very first screening um, in Cary, North Carolina, we had a lot of the local deafblind community there and we would screen it as the feeling through experience during these screenings, which is feeling through a supporting documentary called Connecting the Dots, which is available at feelingthrough.com for anyone to see more of the process of how we made the film and worked with Robert and Helen Keller Services. And then a, a panel discussion in Q&A. And one, one of the very first people to stand up at our very first screening was a man who's deafblind, who'd had the entire experience tactilely signed to him. And he said that he, he loved the film and really appreciated the representation. And he said, moreover, you know, people might assume that because I'm deaf and blind, I wouldn't care to go to the movies, but I love this. I love coming out mm. and having this collective experience with other people. I just never have the opportunity because it's never made accessible for me. And I think mm. those kind of being able to share it in that way and, and have people express though, like, especially someone from the deaf blind community express that level of gratitude for what we've done, how we've done it, and also be able to, to break down stere um, assumptions that other people might have has been, is a real example of some of the more, most like rewarding elements of this experience. Beautiful, Doug. I have one more follow-up question with that, because in this short, there's a lot of questions around. It's a short, it's a, it's a moment. You're capturing this beautiful moment, but their lives go on. Have you thought about expanding it into a feature or a series. I just think, you know, that there's more there. <laughs> yeah. Well, in the short answer is yes, absolutely. Um, we're going to, we're going to, um, tell a, a longer form version of this story a hundred percent, not because not and first and foremost, I think it's because it, because I've always had that instinct. It's not, you know, it wasn't I, before we even ever showed it to anyone. Um, I knew there's more to explore here. It's not just because we've had the great fortune to, to, to be able to share it with a lot of people who are enthusiastic about it. It's because more than anything that there, there's a, there's more of a story in there that demands to be told. And we just want to uncover that and share more with people. Beautiful. Uh, Marley, uh, what do you want audiences to take away with this film? I want audiences to understand that we need to be able to stop taking life and people for granted. Mm. I think that uh, we need to open our eyes and our ears and our hearts and our minds when you meet somebody that you can't judge just by strictly looking at them, that you, uh, that we all live on this earth together and mm. we all have our own lives to lead. And of course we do have diff come from different backgrounds. We all have different stories to tell. We all have, uh, whatever it may be, it, but it's really important and it's time to be yourself and to let people know who you are. Let yourself know them and stop judging. I, I, I'm so over it. I'm so over this, this constant judging. People um, 
some some don't some do some don't but i think it's time that we i just appreciate what we have and to be able to share that and that's what this film does it it it, it shows how we can do that as simple as that thank you mom steven um it's important for audiences to get out there and, and see this film and find this film are there people that you feel like i really want these people to see this film this is important for them besides besides your family and loved ones who want to see a wonderful performance but like who do you think should really see this film right now well because the story is so universal i i just felt like everyone should see it. like li literally when it was available on youtube i like just started sending it out to like everyone i didn't, i was just like it was just like a mass send out like, just sending it out to everyone and then a few people were getting back to me they were like you i really needed to see this some people were saying like, you know, like, especially everything that's going on, like, I really need to see it. Like some of my companions, some of my friends and like their, their take on it made me have to go back and, and watch the film. Like, whoa, like I didn't even, I probably didn't catch some of these things. Cause sometimes when you create something, you don't really sometimes know what it is. Like I heard um, Erica Badu said that uh, to never explain your art, to just let the other people to interpret it themselves. Because if like Tupac explained his music, you'll feel like, well, oh, I thought already knew Tupac, something like that. So like for me to go back right. and see like everyone took from it, it was like, just wow. And to see the conversation that's happening from it, it that's, I feel is the most rewarding part to to see how it is, how it's affecting everyone and, and seeing that everyone's saying that, you know, I took a lot of things for granted and you know, life can, you, you will be okay. Like those are the things that really stood out to a lot of people. Uh, Robert's line saying that you'll be okay. You know, a lot of people do need to hear that, especially in the time that we're living in. Uh, but I get emotional just thinking about it because I think that line in particular is so significant because sometimes that's all you want is for someone to see you literally. I mean, I mean figuratively, literally to, to see you and see but, through the idea that he is, in the deaf blind community, but he sees you. What, he what, uh, you, you know, to piggyback, sorry, to piggyback on what you're saying there, uh, Doug. No, no please. Yes, Doug, uh, you know, helping me out, coaching me through like scenes, the bus, the bus scene, uh, when I'm talking to the bus driver, Doug was mentioned to me, like, you know, that dialogue, like, think about, like, it's also speaking for myself as well. So, like, I felt yeah. like both. Hear me. I, Yes, hear yeah. me. Yeah, right. So I feel like the 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 relation of our characters is that double on that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, right. Exactly. We both felt unseen, unheard, and that that was something yes. else that I felt mm. stood out. Yeah. Beautiful. Thank you, and Robert. I think mm -hmm. I think it's important. I think it's important to add, Stephen, that um, when for those of you who see this, I want. And I hope that people of the young generation have an opportunity to see this and understand how his character helps someone. For example, in this situation, the Roberts character is is older. I mean, we're we're, we're talking about all kinds of levels here. We're talking about um, disability, non-disabled, young, old. Uh, it's just an important message on all levels here. Yeah, the, the 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 compassion. I feel like is are one of the things that that's important, compassion and kindness. Exactly. And so, like these are things that are, that I feel is needs to be shown that it's okay to be compassionate and, and kind. You know, it could be easily taken away by things you can hear, especially for me as an African American male. Like you know, things that you hear coming up in 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 in, in the environment that some will be raised in, that it's probably not okay to always show that side of you and that this strength in it actually. Mm, that's beautiful. Oh my God. That's thank you. Uh, Robert, I think I'm going to wind this down by asking you a question. And there's a question that I, that I think I know very well, that I'm asking you because I know this as well. As an actor, you seek out things that will change you and hopefully change the world a little bit. I want to know how has this process changed you? Well, when you think about my life before the film, you know, I had bumps in the road just like everybody else. You know, I wasn't really very happy with myself. I'll be honest, I was struggling. 
and having this experience and being able to do this with Doug really changed my whole life, my outlook. Mm. I feel like I can change the world's understanding, our collective consciousness of being kind, of being friendly, regardless of whether you call yourself hearing or sighted or blind or deafblind, whatever it is, we, the world, every single living person on earth, we are one. And regardless of whether you have a disability or not, regardless of how you see yourself, regardless, go on and live your life. And that we can do it together and don't be afraid of each other. I think that, you know, I'm just happy with the connection, the, the togetherness, and that we are all brothers and sisters of one God, of one universe, of one blessing. And that's what I want people to see and not to put on airs. This is real life. You're right. There are people out there that don't know anything about me, my community, or who I am, and have never met a deafblind person. Sure. Great. But here I am. And we can help each other regardless. So my end game, I think, is don't be afraid. We are one world. Amen to that. Amen to that. Doug, Marley, Robert, Stephen, uh, what you have given us feels like a sermon for 2021 and kindness and reaching out to others, touch, um, all those things to go deeper because sometimes it's not about what you may know here, it's about what you feel. And so I think that's exactly what's the, the whole point of your short is wanting us to feel a bit more and reach out to each other. I'm a little emotional because I think this panel was really beautiful. And I think these are words we all need to hear right now. We need to hear more words about kindness and reaching out to each other. And we can all do that with, with film. Uh, so I thank you for what you put into the world. And thank you for letting me be a part of this panel. Um, outstanding work by you all. And I hope that this gets into many people's hands and you do the thing that you set out to do, which is change the world and bring us together. So thank you. Thank you, Coleman. Thank you so much, Coleman. Thank you. Thank you, Coleman. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Right. Without further ado, thank you. Go on with your afternoons. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>